American Gastroenterological Association. Today's webinar will focus on managing triple therapy in the treatment experience patient. My name is Vinod Rusky and I will serve as the moderator. Following today's presentation, questions will be taken by our presenter, Dr. Stuart Gordon, on the line and by myself. Questions can be submitted at any time online by using the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. When submitting a question, please provide your location. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on www.gastro.org for future use. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Stuart Gordon. He is the Director of Hepatology at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. Stuart, would you like to go ahead? Thanks very much, Vinod, and welcome to everybody. Thank you all for, for tuning in this morning. We, we want to keep this uh, interactive as much as possible and keep it practical and relevant to your clinical practices. Uh, this morning's discussion will be focusing on managing triple therapy in the treatment experience patients that, with a particular emphasis on, on side effect management uh, and on anemia and, and some of the uh, nuances of viral load determination. But once we finish up, we really want to open it up and hear about your cases and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and keep it interactive. So with, with that little background, why don't we just sort of move to the first slide here and, and, and start off with a, with a representative case. It's, it's very uh, similar to an actual case. And this was a physician who uh, stuck himself many years ago during residency and uh, acquired type C hepatitis. Not a very uh, uncommon scenario, unfortunately. He has genotype 1A, and his biopsy showed a fair amount of steatosis and metavir 3 fibrosis in 2003. He underwent one course of uh, antiviral therapy and, and achieved some meaningful decline in viral load that never became viral negative. He's now heard about the triple therapy regimens and very much what wishes to uh, consider another go at it. Next slide. So he's, he's, he's a little overweight and he's uh, developed some uh, 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 coronary artery disease over the years. He now has uh, two stents placed in. He has diet controlled diabetes and he takes a torvastatin at a low dose as well as a daily aspirin. On examination, he's uh, got a spider angioma and a palpable liver, uh, and, and he's overweight. Next slide. His CBC is, is notable for a slight drop in platelet count. L enzymes that are a little on the high side, his ALT is persistently ranged in the, in the uh, 300 range. His albumin is 3.5, a little bit low and his HCV RNA level is 6,370,000. He tolerated his previous course of therapy reasonably well, um, but he then subsequently went on to receive two years of maintenance uh, therapy. So as you know, maintenance um, head therapy was, was uh, quite popular for a brief period of time there before the uh, HALT-C trial uh, called a halt to that, so he, but he did take PEG for a, a, mon, a monotherapy maintenance. He had no PEG dose reductions during his prior therapy, but he did require EPO during therapy, and we don't know his IL-28 genotype. So things that you need to discuss with patients who are presenting to you with this type of scenario include what are the chances of of a sustained urologic response with these newer triple therapy regimens. Uh, what is the likely benefit? What is the likelihood of a sustained response? And what are the benefits of those downstream benefits um, versus the potential development of resistance? So is there a likelihood that triple therapy will benefit this individual? Or is there a likelihood that this triple therapy uh, may actually cause some uh, uh, detriment uh, in his Goodbye. regimen therapy? So, we need to discuss the role of pre-treatment resistance testing. Should we be checking IL-28 on these patients? Is there a need to repeat the liver biopsy to confirm that he's now, in fact, psoriatic? And what is the role of lead-in versus no lead-in? As you know, we have two different regimens, 
each with a different strategy of, of uh, starting off therapy, one with triple therapy at the outset and the one with a lead-in of peg and ribavirin. Next slide. Additional considerations. This patient was a physician. We don't have we have a var wide variety of patients uh, visiting us every day. What is their motivation? What is the likelihood that they are going to adhere to a rather heavy pill burden uh, for a period of up to 48 weeks? Uh, are there cost considerations? Uh, side effect management during therapy? Uh, what about the use of concomitant medications? Uh, is there a risk of discontinuing statins, for example, in an individual with coronary artery disease? And then finally, I think one of the more um, uh, problematic and vexing questions for all of us is, should we treat now or should we wait for the newer regimens that we know are around the corner? I think of all the slides that have come out looking at the uh, post hoc analyses of the telapavir and docepavir trials, uh, one of the most intriguing is this one. It was from the telapavir trial and it was looking at REALIZE, which is uh, patients who had previously failed PEG and ribavirin therapy before. And they were stratified by their um, prior response. This, this, this trial was looking at um, prior relapsers, prior partial responders, and prior null responders. And we knew exactly who got into these trials, for example. You couldn't even get into these trials unless you had very scrupulous source documentation showing that the relapsers were indeed relapsers and that the nulls were in fact patients who had less than a two-log decline with PEG and ribavirin. So you can be sure that these patients are who they said they were. But this particular slide is looking at the uh, response to triple therapy as a function not only of the prior response to PEG and ribavirin, but also as a function of the degree of fibrosis. Okay, so the numbers here vary, and we don't, some of the groups don't have large numbers, but we're looking here at three groups of patients in three types of prior non-response. So we have minimal fibrosis, bridging fibrosis, or cirrhosis, both in the prior relapsers and in the partial responders, and also in the prior null responders. And I think that what stands out here to me is that even if you have prior cirrhosis, or if you have cirrhosis, for example, if your prior response was that of a relapse, you did pretty well with triple therapy, 86, 85, 84. So the presence of cirrhosis um, didn't hinder the response to triple therapy. Whereas let's look over here at the prior null responders. Individuals who had cirrhosis had only a 14% chance of of responding to triple therapy. These are all the cooled to lapravir peg ribavirin groups. Uh, so it's 10% in the peg ribavirin, 14% in the lapravir peg ribavirin. So clearly cirrhosis or advancing fibrosis did make a difference in the retreatment if the prior response was partial or null, whereas if there was a relapse then there was a, a pretty decent chance of responding to triple therapy, regardless of the degree of fibrosis. So you can see, for example, in our individual who had a prior partial response, whether he's bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis, we'd be looking at about a 34 to 56 percent chance of response. So to me, this is a, a, an enlightening type of a slide as we have our conversations with patients in the office who wish to undergo triple therapy who've been previously treated. Next slide. So again, he would be designated a prior partial responder in that he had a more than two log decline to peg and ribavirin previously. But his last therapy was nearly one decade ago. His biopsy showed rather significant fibrosis. Uh, he's overweight, um, but he's been otherwise medically healthy and stable and working every day and doing very well. What else do you want to do on this guy? Should we be checking his IL-28? The ITPA gene is looking for um, the likelihood of getting anemia for ribavirin. It's not very commonly used, but it's, it's an interesting gene marker out there as well. Do you want to repeat his biopsy and, and prove to yourself that he has progressed to cirrhosis, or do you use the fact that he has palpable hepatomegaly borderline from cytopenia, 
uh, spider angioma, et cetera, is pretty good evidence that he is likely cirrhotic. What is the role of imaging, AFP, and the list goes on now. Next slide. Well, the decision is made to start triple therapy. He initiates PEG and ribavirin. The ribavirin has started off at 600 milligrams BID, and he started on tilapavir 800 milligrams every eight hours. He tolerates therapy without symptoms, and after the completion of four weeks of therapy, his hemoglobin has dropped a bit to 11.5, and his HCVRNA has gone down to 276. Should he continue therapy? Well, we don't have the lines open today, and nobody's going to be taking a quiz here, but I'll think to yourselves, what would you be doing in your private practice? Remember that the cutoff now at week four is, is you know, a thousand, so we really want him to be dropping down to a thousand. He doesn't have to go negative, right? So we'd like him to go negative by week four, obviously, um, but we're allowed to continue therapy at this point. So next slide. Therapy continues for an additional four weeks. And at treatment week eight, he's still doing well, but his hemoglobin is now down to 9.2. So he's, he's kind of dropping down there, right? Um, his neutrophil count stays adequate, and his HCV RNA is less than 43, but still detectable. So he's not quite down to undetectable. And you can look at his uh, hematologic trend here, and you see that he's gone now from 15.2 to 9.2 in eight weeks of therapy, so a fairly significant drop in hemoglobin, especially for a man with coronary artery disease. So what do we want to do at this point? Next slide. Well, here's where the art of anemia management comes about. Um, do we decrease the dose of ribavirin? If so, by how much? Do we add on EPO? If so, by how much? Do we make no change in his PEG? no change in his ribavirin, no change in his protease inhibitor therapy, or do we do A and B? Well, the devil is in the details. Let's just go back there for just a second here, and I just want to sort of, you know, give you my answer on this, because there is really no one answer, but in the Tlapugur-based trials, you were not allowed to add EPO. In the Bosepavir-based trials, EPO was permitted, but not in the Tlapugur-based trials. So what you would do is decrease the dose of ribavirin, and you would go down to 600 milligrams. So there's really only one answer to this question, so to speak, but many people might consider the addition of EPO as well. But let's look at the details of the um, EPO and the ribavirin management in the, in the pivotal registration trials. And certainly we wouldn't um, do number C. We want to do something because he's getting anemic. Next slide. In the Bosepavir-based trials, the triple therapy arms had higher rates of anemia than the patients who did not receive Bosepavir. So we're looking at a 45 to 50 percent incidence of anemia versus a 20 to 30 percent in the PEG ribavirin arms. So clearly more anemia with triple therapy regimens. But the patients with the bosepavir had an additional decrease of hemoglobin of about one gram and a higher frequency of hemoglobin reductions to grade three or higher toxicity. The mechanism of the anemia is probably bone marrow suppressive effect associated with bosepavir, not due to uh, hemolysis, for example, as is observed with ribavirin. So it's an additive effect, and it's probably bone marrow related. The management strategy in the clinical trials with bosepavir consisted of either ribavirin dose reduction or erythropoietin or transfusion, and it was at the discretion of the investigator. It wasn't protocol mandated. So a variety of options were available to the investigator uh, pertaining to how anemia was to be managed during the course of the trial. Next slide. And in the post hoc analysis, the sustained virologic response was looked at according to EPO use and according to ribavirin dose reduction. This was data that was presented at, at EASL. It was also presented to the FDA at the time of uh, drug registration. And in this post hoc analysis, looking at what the investigators did and how the 
patients fared, you can see that there wasn't a whole lot of difference across the different strategies. So the SVR rate for patients who had only EPO was very similar to the small number of patients who only had rivalidar and dose reduction. It's kind of interesting that very few of the investigators chose to go with only rivalidar and dose reduction when they were offered the option of EPO. Among those patients who had both EPO and ribavirin dose reduction, still not a whole lot of difference, and neither strategy again. So there was very little um, that stood out here, be beginning to give us the impression then that, it, that the addition of EPO really didn't make a whole lot of difference uh, as far as SVR rates in order to maintain ribavirin uh, at, its, at its standard doses. Next slide. As far as the telapavir-based trial, here's the anemia summary. And again, higher rates of anemia were seen in patients who, who were treated with telapavir. Telapavir-containing arms had about double the incidence of anemia as those patients who had just pegan ribavirin. So once again, we're looking at an additive effect, probably a bone marrow-related uh, suppression. But, but clearly, more anemia with triple therapy is compared to dual therapy. Patients with telapavir had a higher frequency of hemoglobin reductions to grade 3 or higher, and a higher frequency of hemoglobin levels less than 8.5. So clearly, both drugs were exacerbating anemia. EPO was not used during the clinical trials with telapavir, and instead, anemia was mandated with ribavirin dose reduction. That was the way it was written into the protocol. Next slide. So one of the things that we learned here was that anemia itself had no real effect on sustained virologic response in telapavir-based regimens. Here we're looking at patients who did have anemia on the left, and patients who did not have anemia here on the right. Next slide. Well, the trial that hasn't yet been published, but which was presented at EASL a few months ago, was a randomized control trial for anemia management. And the strategies were either EPO or ribavirin dose reduction with bocepivir and PEG interferon ribavirin therapy. So the patients didn't have a choice, and the investigators didn't have a choice. It was a nicely designed trial. Patients started off with PEG ribavirin as a lead-in strategy for the first four weeks, and then bocepivir was added in at week four uh, after the lead-in strategy. If the hemoglobin dropped to less than or equal to 10 grams, the patients were then randomized to either reduce their ribavirin or to have EPO added. If hemoglobin went to less than 8.5, then there was a secondary strategy, and the investigators could, at that point, either add EPO, ribavirin, dose reduce, or transfuse as needed. So this was an intent to treat analysis. The primary efficacy endpoint was an SVR. The primary efficacy analysis was for all randomized patients. And hemoglobin was measured every two weeks, from week 0 to week 20, and every four to eight weeks thereafter. Next slide. And the results were, uh, you know, quite impressive because I don't think I can recall any trial that was identical. Usually you see some, you know, difference in the bars here. And I, I, you, you cannot design a trial to be more perfectly um, uh, um, uh, resulted as, as this one. 82, 82, 71, 71. There was no difference. The end of treatment response and the sustained virologic response and the relapse rate was identical whether there was ribavirin dose reduction or whether there was the addition of EPO. SVR rates were similar between management strategies, regardless of race, sex, body weight, fibrosis score, or IL-28 genotype.
Next slide. Here again, looking at ribavirin dose reduction on sustained virologic response uh, in treatment experience patients in the telapavir trials. These are all telapavir pooled groups. Whether the strategy was ribavirin dose reduction or no ribavirin dose reduction, whether we're looking at relapsers, partial responders, or null responders, really not seeing any difference in the response rates. Next slide. So I think that it is now fair to summarize that anemia management recommendations currently in patients with protease inhibitor-based therapy should consist of monitoring the patients very closely for hemoglobins less than 10. Um, certainly as CBC pretreatment, but CBCs need to be checked very closely. If you have patients who are dropping their hemoglobin very quickly, especially in your psoriatic individuals, you don't want them to be dropping precipitously because you can get into some trouble. And I think we've all seen that happen now. So easily every two weeks at the outset until week treatment, week eight, then go monthly. But obviously use your discretion according to your individual patient. The primary strategy should consist of ribavirin dose reduction. If ribavirin is discontinued, then the bocepavir or the telapavir should also be discontinued. Do not, repeat, do not reduce the protease inhibitor to manage anemia. We do know that the protease inhibitors are contributing to the anemia, but the strategy of reducing the protease inhibitor uh, may compromise the patient's ability to achieve virologic response and should not be discontinued or reduced in any way. If the hemoglobin drops less than 8.5, discontinue all therapy, but do all you can to prevent that hemoglobin from dropping to that low level. Once ribavirin dose reduction has been tried, EPO can then be used as a secondary strategy, recognizing that it is off-label. We all know that it, it makes patients uh, feel better. Subjectively, they, they, they enjoy it. And we like to see hemoglobin stay up, but we're all cognizant of the fact that EPO has black box warnings, um, which, are, which are obviously of concern. Next slide. So getting back to our patient now. He, at week 12, remains asymptomatic. He's tolerating therapy very well. His hcdRNA now is less than 43, but detectable. What do you want to do at this point? So again, you know, we don't have any keypads here, no tests. But think to yourselves, you know, how are you going to manage this patient at this point? Are you going to stop therapy or are you going to continue? Well, once again, we want these individuals to be less than 1,000. The telapavir-based therapy, as you remember, it's less than 100 for the sepavir. But we're looking at um, uh, still detectable, but that's okay. He doesn't need to go negative at 12. He needs to go negative by 24. So he's still okay. He's not negative, but he's very close. So treatment should really continue at this point. He's completed his 12 weeks of telapavir-based therapy, and he continues on. So next slide. So you do want to continue the peg and ribavirin. Um, he, he is uh, now dose reduced, and his treatment week 16 HCV RNA level is undetectable. He's less than 43, but he's undetectable. At week 20, he remains less than 43, and he's undetectable. Now at week 24, he's less than 43, but the lab now says detectable. So the question that I posed here is, what do you want to do at this point? Should you stop therapy at this point? Continue peg and ribavirin therapy or discontinue? So this is, this is an intriguing type question. I want you to all think about what you want to do at this point because I think we all know that the treatment guidelines say that if you're detectable at 20... at 16 and he was negative at 20. So why is he positive at 24? Is it perhaps a lab error? And I only threw this out here to 
emphasize the fact that we need to be using some common sense here in, in clinical judgment. Next slide. So I continued therapy and I repeated his HCV RNA a week later and it now comes back as less than 43 but undetectable. So I said, you know, what's going on here? I, um, I, I uh, contacted the, the head of the laboratory and, and well, the, the, the head of the lab said that repeat testing of the week 24 specimen, they still had it around and they rechecked it, revealed a probable false positive. It said that it you know, could have been something in the air, it may have been another positive specimen in the same batch, um, and that the currently used specimen tests HCV RNA negative and to use your best clinical judgment. So all of these results often will say use clinical judgment. So what we had was a false positive test at week 24, which when repeated one week later, uh, proved to be still undetectable. So these are exquisitely sensitive assays prone to the possibility of, of false positives and, and false negatives. So we need to be using clinical judgment. Next slide. So he now continues therapy and he goes for the full 48 weeks of treatment and he remains asymptomatic. His hemoglobin is at 10.8 at week 48. He remains on a dose-reduced ribavirin schedule and his HCV RNA at week 48 is undetectable. He's now completed therapy and now the question is when do you recheck his viral level? Well, the answer is uh, you know, if it was you, you, you know, you probably want to know it every week. So I think a lot of people would check it follow-up week four, um, but the definition now of sustained virologic response has been changed from SVR 24 to SVR 12 um, because there weren't patients who relapsed between 12 and 24 as a rule. So I think we can now safely use SVR 12 as our um, endpoint for SVR. Next slide. So he did go on to an SVR, and he is now a complete virologic responder. And the take-home messages here then include the observation that higher sustained virologic response rates are observed both with tolapavir and with both both osepravir and tolapavir and PEG and ribavirin therapy. The response rate is very much dependent on the prior interferon response rate um, and the fibrosis stage. The relapser, however, even with advanced fibrosis, has a, a very high chance of responding to triple therapy, anywhere from 70 to 88 percent. Partial responders, anywhere from 40 to 59 percent, whereas the null responders, anywhere from 29, uh, probably up to about 40 percent. If you look at the PROVIDE trial, it may be up to 40 percent uh, in the null responders. So the potential then is for increased side effects, a higher rate of anemia, and a, a higher chance of resistance-associated variants. This is something that we didn't see with PEG and ribavirin, needless to say. So for patients who have failed prior PEG, or, or for patients who have now failed protease inhibitor therapy, we are looking to the option of combination direct-acting antivirals uh, in the future. Currently, we do not have uh, options available, really very few even in the context of clinical trials. So for individuals who fail protease inhibitor therapy or relapse to protease inhibitor-based triple therapies, we are very much looking forward to combination DAA agents in the future and hopefully not that far off in the future. Next slide. So I think with that, we'll, we'll sort of uh, uh, close out and, uh, and, and open it up to uh, attendance, uh, to, to, to the audience, and uh, just to sort of make it a little bit more open. I think we really wanted to uh, make this an interactive type of a, of a program. Thanks, Stuart. You know, as a reminder, questions can be submitted online by using the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please provide your location when you do submit a question. And while we're waiting for some of that, maybe, Stuart, you know, this patient, uh, was in his mid-50s and had cardiac disease. Um, do you routinely do any cardiac testing prior to putting patients on 
analysis on uh, triple therapy and what parameters to follow? You know, I don't think we're using routine cardiac testing here. I mean, it might be nice to get ejection fraction. It might be nice to get some clearance from the cardiologist. Fortunately, we haven't seen significant uh, uh, cardiac events. But um, it's obviously worrisome, and especially when you're stopping uh, a statin therapy. I mean, I think that the conventional wisdom is that if you have such significant coronary artery disease, um, that you really should not be undergoing such therapy because the risk may be too high. So I will often um, ask for cardiologic clearance. We, we, we are not routinely capping patients. We will often ask the cardiologist to clear them, for example. But s significant coronary artery disease uh, is a contraindication. We don't want to be in the situation where, where individuals were infarcting on therapy. And I think it's important to recognize that you know, uh, CHF, or significant cardiomyopathy, is a a contraindication, but we're going to be seeing this um, increasingly now as the population is aging. We're dealing with an older cohort uh, of individuals with chronic hepatitis C. So I think that it, it, it's, a, it's a very important question that we're going to be asking ourselves more and more. Um, I, I have not been getting routine cardiac cast, but mostly asking for uh, you know the cardiologist to give their go-ahead. I think in the pivotal trials, um, it, it was left to the discretion of the investigator, which obviously we're not cardiologists. Um, what's your approach, Vino? Well, I think we've arbitrarily, kind of like the transplant population, suggested that they get a stress test if they're the, over the age of 60. I mean, this particular patient dropped his hemoglobin six points, and there may be occult coronary disease in some of these patients. So we have asked for cardiac clearance and or a stress test over the age of 60. Certainly reasonable. Sir, also, you know, you very nicely showed that ribavirin reduction, uh, we're not really paying a price, but how about if we have to reduce the dose of interferon? That's another question, not only of, uh, of you know, how low can you go on the ribavirin, but the interferon. You know, we, we know, for example, from the IDEAL trials that was looking at two different doses of uh, pegintron, the 1.5 mg per kg and the 1.0 mg per kg, that there was really very little difference in the SVR and, in fact, uh, less neutropenia in the 1.0 mg per kg. So I, I think that I'm safe going down uh, on, the, uh, on the interferon. I'm much more comfortable dropping both the pegintron um, and the pegasus um, to about a third, uh, you know, dropping maybe to 135 or even to 90 or certainly to 1.0 micrograms per kilograms on the, uh, on the pegintron without fear of compromising um, uh, their um, SVR rates. We're not doing it as a primary strategy for uh, anemia, but more for the uh, neutropenia and some of the uh, uh, just uh, uh, adverse event type profile of the interferons, the uh, flu-like symptoms. And do, you think, uh, do you think these drug-resistant variants will become uh, an important feature as uh, time goes by, or do you think they're going to be uh, overcome with the combinations that will be available to us? You know, it's like listening to politicians talking about some of these thorny issues here, and the reality is, is that nobody knows for sure. And, uh, you know, we, we wish we had a solid answer that we could convincingly tell our, our colleagues and our patients um, but no one really knows for sure, and uh, it's really one of the great unspokens uh, as we're using these agents is is blowing the class and rendering individuals um, unable to take that particular uh, category again in the future. There's very limited data on, on retreatment of these individuals. It speaks to the fact that we need to follow the stopping rules closely so that there's not the development of the compensatory mutations, but it's hard to believe that the development of a resistance um, is not going to have any effect at all on retreatment. Fortunately, we have um, other um, targets, you know, the, the, uh, the, the polymerase agents and the NS5As, et cetera, so we're, we're optimistic that because we have these different targets that we will be able to overcome uh, the protease-resistant variants, and we're, we're reassured um, that ultimately down the road we'll be able to use these new agents. Um, but obviously it's sort of lurking at the back of our minds that it may perhaps compromise 
ability to respond to the same category of agents in the future. And I think it's a, it's a conversation that needs to be uh, had with the patient. So I, you know, my feeling is that we don't know for sure, but we're, but we're very much optimistic that we'll be able to overcome these, these resistance if we catch them soon enough. Stuart, that's too honest an answer. You won't be able to run for office. You no, no, no. I, we say it the way it is. What are your thoughts, uh, Vina? No, I, I, can't, I can't see that anybody would disagree with what you just said. We do have a question from the audience from uh, Joanne from North Carolina. Sir, you mentioned the SVR rates were similar between reduction of ribavirin or adding EPO. Were there differences in anemia improvement? I don't think that that was looked at as a primary target here. We were able to maintain, I mean, clearly we were able to maintain the ribavirin uh, levels with just the EPO alone, and I think that was the reason why the EPO was used. So I think that, you know, intuitively, EPO will maintain the, the hemoglobin levels, uh, yes. Um, but is is that really the, uh, the the bottom line, or is it the SVR? So I would think that you know the EPO did maintain uh, better ribavirin levels, but um, without the ribavirin dose reduction. But I think the take-home message is that the the, 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 the response rate was the same uh, in the end. I, I hope I answered the question. Is that your understanding of it as well? You know. Sir, you mentioned uh, in the beginning about, you know, uh, the availability of future combinations. Uh, do you have a timeline in mind? Are there people you're already suggesting they wait for interferon pre-combinations? Are there patients who should not wait? How do you how do you approach that question? Yeah, I mean, this, you know, I think we need to explain this to our patients, for example. I mean, we are all aware of, of data that has been presented. Uh, my estimation is that it won't be in 2013, that it may be the following year that we may have some of these new agents out there. But if everybody is looking for a, a, a couple pills a day, I don't think it's going to be for a couple of years. And I think that, you know, we've been waiting for, you know, over a decade for these current agents to come available. And, and if the, you know, word is just, you know, wait another few more years, um, I, I think that it's probably in the easy to treat patients that you can rapidly get rid of, probably cost effective to just uh, treat them now to prevent their disease from progressing. So I am still treating uh, certainly our relapsers, some of our easy to treat patients. On the other hand, you need to have some in-depth um, uh, conversation with patients to explain uh, the pros and the cons, you know, the side effect profiles. Uh, the percent, per, 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 potential for resistant profiles and the possibility of newer regimens down the road, but without the uh, uh, promises here. We don't know that, that these 100% type numbers that we're hearing about are going to hold out in, in phase three trials. So there are no guarantees. But an answer to your question is, you know, yes, I, I am. I think that for some of our twos and threes, for example, where we don't have any of these protease inhibitor agents and um, there are some problematic response rates with our current therapies, um, and they may just want to wait a little bit, uh, another couple of years. Um, that may be reasonable. For individuals who really say, I, I cannot tolerate the side effects of interferon-based therapy, I am willing to wait. I'm willing to wait with them. On the other hand, we don't want them to, to decompensate. We, we know, for example, that treating cirrhotics who are borderline decompensated we know from data that was presented at EASL that these triple therapy agents may well tip them over the edge and needing transplant sooner rather than later. So we're, we're, we're very cautious about our borderline cirrhotics to use these triple therapy regimens. I would say that a null responder to pegan ribavirin um, who is advanced fibrosis or cirrhotic um, who has a, a less than 50% and perhaps even a less than 20% chance of responding with triple therapy may well want to wait a bit longer to improve their sustained response rates and to minimize their chance of virologic resistance. So yes, I am hoarding, but I'm also having uh, long, in-depth conversations with patients and, and making them a partner in the decision process. So probably too long an answer, I agree, but uh, <laughs> I'm always happy to hear your thoughts as well, Dina. I think, I think that's exactly right. I, I mean, you know, I, I think around the country, 
patients are obviously uh, very sophisticated and uh, have all sorts of internet resources available to them, chat rooms, etc. I often have people coming in who are, uh, you know, in the lead-in phase and say, well, I just saw that this particular trial is going to be reported at the liver meetings in Boston in two weeks. Uh, why shouldn't I get that? You know, it's, it's amazing how quickly this information is disseminated. And, um, and so we often, in the position of uh, having to not necessarily um, tell people what to do, but certainly help guide them, but many people are coming in with their own thoughts about what they want to do. It is. It's, I, it's, it's astounding to me that I will sometimes hear the results of these trials from my patients who are not only on these chat rooms, but are, are, are getting, you know, direct feeds from, uh, from the companies and we'll, we'll hear these results hot off the press. There was a time when we would, you know, wait for the journal article to come out. Now it's, it's all a 24-hour news cycle here and, and you're absolutely right. The patients are very keen to take the, the newest and the best and, um, and they want it out there. I think, you know, one of the other questions that this really begs is, is there a way that we can speed up the process here? You know, I mean, there are patients whose lives are literally uh, hinging on these new agents coming available, and uh, you know how can we um, speed up the process to get these drugs available? I'm just, just asking the question rhetorically, but um, it, it, we're in a very uh, precarious time now between 2012 and 2015 or so um, as we transition from these uh, very difficult therapies, uh, presumably into the much uh, more effective and easy therapies, and I think people are going to look back at this time frame and say, you know, why weren't people um, a, a little bit more aggressive um, in, in, in moving through the process? It's frustrating. Uh, we do know that, that, that there are better days to come here now, but right now we're in a, in a particularly difficult time where these decisions must be made. You know, I'd like to ask a question of the audience. With the CDC recommendation of uh, screening people for FC born between 1945 and 1965. Has anybody noticed an uptick in, uh, in that being implemented in their areas, or is it going to take longer for that the recommendation to penetrate? Can, can we get some uh, feedback from around the country here? Please feel free to chime in. I'm always anxious to hear people's thoughts. How about in Detroit, Stuart? What do you think? Do you have any? I haven't noticed anything here in Washington, D.C., but have you noticed that this recommendation is people are even aware of it? You know, we're doing something, you know, with the CDC just internally here at Ford where we're going to try to start implementing something like that. But, you know, I sort of compare it to, uh, you know, screening the pregnant women for hepatitis B. I mean, I'm sort of dating myself here, but, you know, a lot of the obstetricians uh, were really very reluctant to screen pregnant women for hepatitis B. Not only that, they fought it tooth and nail. Uh, they, they, why should we be doing this? Give me an explanation why. And now, you know, it's routine. Every pregnant woman has their hepatitis B testing done. It's going to take a while. There's going to be resistance. And I think we're going to have to start seeing, you know, what's about to unfold here over the next decade with the, uh, the hepatitis C epidemic as people start seeing it in their practices to sort of realize, hey, this this is real. So, I mean, we're being told of this impending crisis, but it hasn't trickled down, I don't think, to the family practice or to the internist. Um, you know, it may not necessarily be covered. It, it, it has definitely not uh, sunk in. We are aware of it, but, I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's made its way into, into uh, real time yet. Um, we have a comment uh, from uh, North Carolina that uh, they have not seen an increase, as uh, I think most of us would agree. The problems with payment for testing if the patient has no other risk factors is listed as a, as one of the uh, one of the um, uh, limitations. You know, I, it's interesting. You know, it's sort of off the cuff here, but I you know I sort of compare it to you know some of these uh, HPV vaccinations and you know and and uh, you know catching young adults and you know the notion of uh, well I'm not at risk and you know my daughter's not at risk and uh, you know it's sort of the same thing you know for individuals who you know, we're in that, you know, birth cohort who are clearly not at risk. Uh, they may perhaps uh, perceive it as uh, uh, as offensive, you know, to undergo that sort of testing. And so it's it's the public good, obviously. You know, I mean, it, you know, the numbers are uh, 
so much higher in that group, maybe one in thirty. Um, you know, the, that it's just for the public good to screen that group. But, but clearly, we know that there are a lot of people who are going to be negative. I mean, you know, we can go by these Markov models and say yes, it, it, it makes cost effectiveness, um, but it's it, it's not being done. And, and clearly, this is um, a, a part of people's past that is not going to be. Um, that mentioned in, in most physical, uh, you know, examinations. Uh, so it, it'll be an ongoing battle, I suspect. Well, I think uh, I think we've reached the end of the webinar. We thank everybody for joining us today. Please note that this webinar will be available on www.gastro.org within four to six weeks. I'd like to thank Dr. Gordon very much for what I thought was an excellent presentation. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Vina. We hope this information is useful in helping you treat and manage HCV. If your question was not answered today, we have established a panel of mentors across the country who can answer your questions on diagnosis and treatment starting now through January of 2013. We will email you the list plus directions on how to contact a mentor immediately following this webinar. You will receive a post-test and survey at the conclusion of the webinar. Please take a moment to complete them. Your input will help us with future webinars. This concludes the webinar for today. Hopefully everybody will enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.